Thank you. 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 Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Baer, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Policy Research here at Carnegie, and it's a pleasure to have you all here with us today. Um, we are approaching uh, the day that we will mark one year since Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, uh, and um, at, though we can remark that a year is an arbitrary amount of time, it's much longer than many people thought um, this war would last, and a year is an opportunity for us to reflect, first and foremost, on the tremendous loss of life um, and the outstanding courage of the Ukrainian people uh, in the face of this violent aggression, but also to reflect on how the war has affected the rest of us, um, how it has affected the way that we understand the world that we live in, how it has affected government policies. And in that respect, one of the most interesting points of reflection is Germany's response uh, to the invasion of Ukraine. Because three days after the invasion began, Germany's chancellor gave a seminal speech in which he announced a real sea change, not only in how Germany understood uh, European security and its position in the world, but also how it, will, how it would approach foreign and security policy. And so today, we're really thrilled to have um, a kind of unusual program for us because it actually starts with a presentation of data, which is not to say that we're allergic to data and facts, generally speaking, but usually we have panel discussions that, that jump right in. But today we're going to start with a presentation of some polling data that, that kind of gives a sense of where both the American people and the German people are uh, about a year later. And then we will have a panel discussion um, to talk about uh, what, what that data means, use that as a jumping off point for, for where we are, and then have a wider discussion about uh, reflecting on where we are a year in. Um, I'm delighted to have a, a really great crew here today. So first, we're going to hear from two uh, representatives of research uh, projects. Um, the first will be uh, Julia Gonter, who is a program manager at the Kobus Stiftung. And then we'll hear from J Jacob Pushter from Pew. And they will both present us with uh, kind of complementary findings on public opinion. And then we will have a, uh, a panel that will be moderated by Steve Sokol, who's the president of the American Council on Germany. It will include the participation of Ambassador Haber, the German ambassador in the US who has a long and distinguished career uh, before then, including uh, I've gotten into discussion of nuclear policy with her in the past. Uh, she knows so much about so many things, um, but we'll limit her, her scope today. Um, Ambassador Markarova, you've been a tremendous representative of your country over the last, uh, in an unfortunate circumstance, and obviously came out of the finance ministry before um, with deep expertise, and we're really glad to have you here today, and thank you for all the work that you've done over the last year. It's been really impressive to watch. My colleague Sophia Besch will join me, and then I will be the, um, the, uh, the, the less impressive uh, member of that panel. So um, without any further ado, let me invite Julia up to share her, uh, her research findings. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Dan, for your introduction and for having us here today. And my special thanks goes to Sophia, who has put so much dedication and time into bringing us all here and making this happen. And also welcome from my side and on behalf of uh, Körber Stiftung. Before I share some three brief observations uh, from our latest uh, the Berlin Pulse public opinion survey results, I want to say some words on um, uh, the publication and methodology. And I think we can't see the slides on the screen, but I'm sure we will in a minute, at least not behind me. But I'll already tell you something about, here they are, about uh, methodology, because I think it's relevant when we look at survey results. So first of all, the Berlin Pulse Survey is a survey that we do in this format since 2017. So this enables us to already observe some trends when it comes to German public opinion. Um, results from Germany, and my colleague Jacob will talk about results from the US in a minute, but results on uh, from Germany, they are based on a representative survey that was conducted over the phone with around 1,000 Germans aged 18 years and older, and it was conducted in the first two weeks of August. 
So now let's jump right in with the first results. Um, we have heard it from Dan, three days after the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine took place, the German Chancellor talked about this event being also a so-called Zeitenwende, a watershed moment, a turning point uh, for German foreign and defense policy. And I think from my perspective, being a person in, that analyzes uh, German public opinion, it is very interesting to see how this Zeitenwende, this turning point, is reflected in German public opinion also. And my first observation would be, and you can already see the result here, that this turning point is not reflected at a first glance in German public opinion, but I would bear to say that it's reflected at a second glance in German public opinion. Now, why would I say that it's not reflected at a first glance in German pu public opinion? The reason is that a question we asked since 2017 is if Germans want to engage more internationally. And uh, last year, as well as all the years before, a slight majority of Germans says that they prefer restraint over a stronger international involvement, and the invasion of Ukraine has not changed their view. Um, of the 41% who are actually in favor of a stronger international engagement, a vast majority thinks that this engagement should be diplomatic, and only 14% of these 41% uh, in favor of a stronger international engagement want this engagement to be military. Now, there's another uh, result that, uh, from my analysis, indicates that there's not really a watershed moment in German public opinion since the invasion. Um, that is that almost seven out of 10 Germans, they don't want their country to become a military leader in Europe. So I would say that there's quite a gap between uh, the 100 billion special fund for the German military and the vision of the German public currently when it comes to the leadership role of Germany because the special fund, it makes Germany the biggest spender for military and defense in Europe and the third biggest in the world. But why did I say at a second lens, I would say that there is kind of a shift going on in German public opinion. The reason for this is this result. Six out of 10 Germans, they are in favor of a, to durably invest more money uh, uh, in defense. And uh, when we compare this result with other results that we have uh, polled in 2019, for example, when only four out of 10 Germans were in favor of, a, of um, investing more money in defense, we can see that there's quite a change going on. Now, another question that uh, was posed many times uh, in the reflections um, on Germany's mistakes that were made with our Russia policy was, what can we learn from what is currently going on with regards to our relations with China? When it comes to the German public, 66% of Germans, they want to decrease uh, our German economic dependencies on China, even if this harms economic uh, interests of Germany. And uh, this actually fits to the overall negative trend uh, in perceptions of China and Germany. Um, last year, 59% of Germans, they said that they perceived China's international influence as rather negative. And this is quite a downward trend that we can observe since 2017 in this regard. To conclude, one last uh, observation um, on the effect of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on transatlantic relations. Um, because we can observe uh, from last year's result that Germans have the most positive view on the transatlantic relationship since we started polling in 2017. 82% of Germans, they said that they perceive transatlantic relations as good or very good. And the main explanation uh, from my perspective for this is the degree uh, to which Germans perceive the U.S. as a partner when it comes to the protection of European security, these 81% that you can see up here. But as Jacob has more uh, results on that aspect of transatlantic relations, I stop here and leave it to you to uh, talk a little bit more about that aspect. Thank you so much. said this data, most of it is from last summer, last July, August, although in the last slide there will be some new data that Pew Research Center put out uh, just two days ago. So there is some newer data involved here. 
So one of the big trends that we found over the last couple of years, and this is very important to note, is that U.S.-German relations are pretty good right now. 80% uh, in both countries say that relations are good. And this is actually a change in Germany from two years ago. But in the U.S., um, as you can see, since we started this polling in 2017, uh, most Americans say that the relationship between the U.S. and Germany is good. Uh, on the German side, you see a sea change about two years ago. Obviously, there was a presidential election. Uh, and the, Germany is not the only European country we see where this has happened. We, we've actually tracked data from uh, France, UK, uh, and also East Asia, Japan, South Korea, which found a much more positive view of the United States since 2021. Uh, um, but this is also reflected in the German-American relationship. Now, while um, Americans say that the partnership is going well on almost every aspect that we ask about, including protecting European security, where 68% of Americans say that Germany is a partner, uh, protecting the environment, et cetera, uh, Germans are much more positive on the security aspect of their relationship than they are on some of the other aspects, such as protecting the environment. I will also note here that Americans comparatively are less likely to see Germany as a partner when it comes with to dealing with China. But as Julia rightly noted, uh, views towards China have become more negative both in the US and Germany over the past couple years. And that remains an issue when it comes to foreign policy. And you'll see here, too, that Americans, on balance, are much more concerned about China as a military threat uh, compared with Germans. Still, uh, a majority of, of Germans say that Russian, Russia is a military threat, and a majority of Americans say that Russia is a military threat. But there's some divergences here when it comes to views of China as a military threat. And there's some partisan differences here, too. Uh, Republicans in the US tend to be more concerned about China. Democrats tend to be more concerned about Russia, although there are concerns among both, uh, both parties about uh, the threats that China and Russia pose. Another interesting factor in the United States is that older Americans are more concerned about this issue than our younger Americans. We see this a lot in, when it comes to security threats around the world, both in America and other countries, where the older generations are much more concerned about the security threats that Russia and China pose than our younger Americans. This could be because of shared experience of past times. And it would be really interesting to note, given the past year, how this changes in the future, whether younger generations are any more concerned about uh, the threat from China and Russia than they were previously. And that's something that we always need to monitor. We always need to keep in mind with public opinion that it can change, that people can change their minds over time, especially as uh, conditions change on the ground. Uh, two more slides just briefly. One, despite you know, the good relations between Germany and the US, Americans still see the UK as their most important foreign policy partner. Uh, I know 24% doesn't sound like a lot, but relative to the other countries which we asked about, um, you know, most Americans say that the UK is the most important foreign policy partner for the US. The special relationship is still uh, uh, a big part of it. And China, you see here, is second. So despite Americans being concerned about China, being especially concerned about uh, China's human rights issues, uh, they are 11% they are, uh, do say that China is the most important uh, partner for the US. And finally, some brand new data, just to keep this very current. Uh, we've been asking since last March whether uh, the US is doing too much to support uh, Ukraine, about right or not enough. And you'll see here that oh, since last March, uh, more Americans now say that the US is doing too much for support, supporting Ukraine. But at the same time, majorities still say it's about right, 31% or not enough, 20%. You also see here an emerging partisan divide in the US. Um, where more Republicans are saying that the U.S. is doing too much to support Ukraine. 40% say that, said that in the most recent poll, versus only 15% of Democrats and those who lean towards the Democratic Party say that uh, the U.S. is doing too much to support Ukraine. So this emerging partisan difference in the U.S. is something that's you know, apparent in the data and I think is uh, very important when thinking about these issues. But overall, we're going to continue to keep on polling on this stuff and keep, keep on working with Kerber uh, to, to see the comparison relationship, relationship, uh, and I will end with that, and I will invite Steve, uh, who's uh, president of the American Council on Germany, to come up and lead the panel with our distinguished ambassadors, and Dan and Sophia, and I really appreciate the time that you've all given for this. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so we can, we can all come up. Um, yeah.
Good afternoon, everybody. And um, a big thanks to both of you, Julia and, and Jacob, for your presentations. I think you've provided us with a, a fantastic um, jumping off point for this panel. And I'm really honored to be moderating this discussion with our two distinguished ambassadors and our two representatives from Carnegie. Uh, there is a lot to talk about. And we don't have a lot of time, um, so I will have asked everybody to, to be short in their comments, um, also to make sure that we have time for questions from all of you. And for those of you who are here in the room, there are cards where you can scan questions and send them. Uh, those of you who are watching online can use the chat function to send questions in. And if your question is um, for a specific panelist, please let me know so I know how to direct your question. Um, so we actually just heard some really positive news, right? Over 80% of Germans polled and 80% of Americans polled are positive about the state of the relationship. That is a great starting point, particularly given how um, many irritations there have been in the bilateral relationship recently. And I'd like to maybe start by asking you, Ambassador Haber, if there was anything that surprised you about these results that we heard today. <clears throat> well, in a way, first of all, I, I need to say this. Uh, I've lost my voice, so <laughs> um, no COVID, but uh, it doesn't really carry anymore. Um, what struck me in a way, and uh, Julia's um, presentation reinforced that impression, is that uh, the survey really reflected to some uh, degree the agonizing debates we're having in Germany uh, about the Zeitenwende about the turning point and uh, about what that requires, uh, uh, German military assistance, uh, uh, German military support, uh, the withdrawal from uh, energy dependence from Russia, uh, and so forth, to do. Um, by this I mean um, that in particular the Zeitenwende, uh, that is when we took the decision, when the Chancellor took the decision uh, to jettison old uh, orthodoxies of German strategic thinking uh, and uh, starting to actually embark on a course that no previous German government uh, had been ready to embark on, he really um, um, set forth a course uh, that broke uh, with traditions uh, probably more uh, than even uh, was thinkable during a reunification, which mm -hmm. changed the environment, but didn't change German strategic thinking. And the disconnect uh, between the high approval rates uh, uh, of our relationship and the uh, thinking in detail on Russia, uh, on the Russian threat, only 22% of uh, the Germans that had been polled uh, say Russia is a real threat. Uh, the high number of those who prefer diplomacy uh, to military uh, support. That tells you something that, in spite of the Zeitenwende, uh, um, um, experiences and traumas that are rooted in the past uh, are still uh, dominating uh, the thinking in, uh, in the population. It's lagging behind, if you will, uh, uh, behind uh, decisions uh, taken uh, by the government. And here's the simple truth. Uh, while the decision to support Ukraine massively, we are now one of the biggest military supporters uh, uh, of Ukraine, uh, um, is of course rooted uh, in the historical experience and conclusion of never again, never must we uh, uh, allow uh, uh, an aggression uh, and uh, a suffering uh, inflicted by a war, uh, uh, by a brutal war um, in our neighborhood. But. In, on all things military, um, there will always be a reticent which is rooted in the same uh, experience of uh, brutal aggressors, uh, um, expansionist war um, uh, in Europe too. So you have to um, you have to balance off these two experiences, and that's what I find uh, reflected uh, in in the survey. You've actually pointed it out uh, before too. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you for that. Um, because the, the data that we've seen today um, is really German and American, I'd like to bring Dan into the conversation next and, and ask you, um, having sort of a good understanding of what's going on in Europe, but also really a very good understanding of what's going on in the US, um, whether there was anything that struck you about some of the, the polling numbers that we heard today. 
Thanks. I, I'm not sure I have a good. Un I appreciate your you're giving me the credibility of having a good understanding of anything. But um, <laughs> but um, I, I mean, I shared some of the same observations as Ambassador Hubbard. But one one first observation is just the the um, we all chuckled at the change in um, German. Uh, perception of the relationship with the U.S. that coincided with the U.S. presidential election, and it's fun to chuckle over how damaging um, the Trump administration's uh, policies were for America's perceived the perceived perception of American relationships around the world. But I think it's also really important as Americans to recognize that you know we were behaving like the kind of spouse in an unhappy marriage who didn't know that it was an unhappy marriage that time. Like that's that's also on us. Like the fact that Americans seem blissfully unaware of the fact that our the perceptions of us change um, dramatically uh, because of choices that governments make. Um, that's an important thing for Americans to think about. I think going forward, and it was interesting. For instance, the German um, dislike or whatever you want to call it for Americans spiked in 2020 when when the Trump administration announced the repositioning of. Uh, a number of, of U.S. Army troops that had been positioned in, in Germany. I don't know if those two things were connected, but it made no perceptible difference in American perceptions of the U.S.-German relationship. But there was a, a real jump in 2020, between 2019 and 2020 in that data. Um, a couple other things that were striking. One, that fewer than half of Germans see America as a partner on energy in 2022 yeah. mm -hmm. is a real failure of American public diplomacy because um, the United States has been working very hard and understands that, German or, uh, that Germans across German society, German industry, are struggling because of the energy consequences of Russia's invasion. And so you know, it, it's striking to me that we're not seen as a partner on that, because we should be seen as a partner on that. And I think the German and US governments are working closely together on that. Um, the most striking thing, however, was the fact that there are more Germans who say that Russia is not a threat than who say that it's a serious threat in the year 2022. It is insane to me that only 22% of Germans think that Russia is a serious security threat when Russia is waging the largest war in Europe since World War II so close to German borders. I, I, I can't explain it, and it's, it, it seems really crazy. And the, the final point, which Ambassador Haber made, is just it's, it strikes me that um, one of the lessons, if I were in um, which is not to say Ambassador Hubbard doesn't understand this, but if I were in the German government, one of the lessons of this is just how much uh, policy decisions have to be um, sold to the public. I mean, the public has to be brought along. We call that leadership. Uh, we call it different things. But um, the German public is obviously not persuaded of the sea change at this point. And, and that is something that um, has consequences for the scope of maneuver for the current German government and also for Germany's security partners going forward. Well, Dan, you've anticipated um, one of the topics that Ambassador Haber would like to talk about and, and one of the questions that I wanted to ask her a little bit later as well, because I think that this you know, lag that we're seeing is a very, very important one. Um, but before we, we get to that, um, Ambassador Marakova, I'd like to bring you into the conversation, uh, not so much about the German piece, but more sort of your observations of um, how Americans perceive security threats as you observe here in Washington and your work in the US, but also using the polling data as a jumping off point. Well, first of all, I think it's very important and thank you for this work because we have to always double check. You know, it's, it's easy for us to assume that people support us or people don't support us and, and it will be changing, but it's very interesting and very useful to see what people are actually responding to the questions. And I would even argue, even though you asked me to con comment on American only, but it's very important also to see it specifically for the US and Germany. Mm -hmm. Because unity is something that is very, um, like a key element of this fight. And our success, our joint success, and us being able to win and bring lasting peace actually it depends on whether we can do it together. Americans, Europeans, Ukrainians, all of us together. So it's very important to stay on the same page. Um, there was no, not a lot of surprises in the, in the polling data. Uh, we see that the vast majority of Americans support this fight. We see that they perceive Russia rightfully so as the threat. We see that the majority of Germans, even though they do not see it as the major threat, but 72% of Germans, if I'm not mistaken, perceive Russia as a threat, whether major or, or minor. But I think what the data is showing us is that, you know, especially given into account how many Germans and how many Americans are concerned about security, 
how many the majority want to invest in a collective transatlantic security, that actually it's not that they don't see it as a threat. It's us, uh, I mean collectively politicians, uh, not being able to communicate that a threat in Ukraine is not a localized threat in Ukraine. So I think we see if Europeans believe, and they only have to listen to Mr. Putin and all his cronies, what he says and what he threatens all of us with, that it's not only about Ukraine, mm -hmm. that it's actually about restoring the whatever Russian Soviet empire, and the threats are much larger than only Ukraine, and actually it's much larger than Europe. It's, and then, ultimately, we will get into the category where everyone would see it as a threat, because that's where people's concern are. So, um, as one of my mentors was saying, people are never wrong. It's, uh, you just have to communicate and, and inform them better. So I think one of the key uh, takeouts from this is that we have to talk to people more and we have to explain better what are the stakes in this war, that Ukraine is not only fighting for almost a year now for our homes and our land and our people, that we are fighting for the international rule of law, we are fighting for a, a possibility for a peaceful country not to be attacked and be able to defend itself and be able to live like we want to live. So it, it's, it's, I think this is a great pool that gives us a lot of food for thought. And I'm you know, hearing an echo in terms of um, you know, having to, to talk to people more, having to explain things more. I think that that's you know, a sentiment that many of us who are working in this field think over and over again. Um, we have to be making the case, right? And we'll, we'll come to that in just a moment. But Sophia, as, as a, a German who's, who's here in the US, um, who works on European security and defense policy, sort of what were, what were your assessments of the, the, the polling data? And I know it's hard coming last um, after, <laughs> after the, the three statements we've heard so far, um, but maybe you could use that just as a, as a jumping off point for, for some of the work that you've been doing and, and some of the things that you've been seeing. Sure, no, thank you. I think it's, it's not actually hard because so many issues were put on the table and I'm just going to um, maybe zoom in on one of them, which was this question of military leadership mm -hmm. and the idea, I think we saw in the poll that about two thirds of Germans reject the idea of becoming a military leader. And yet we hear that in statements all the time now by the German government, the necessity to lead also militarily. And it's also a question that I know people in Berlin are thinking about very seriously as they are you know, writing the new national security strategy because it's something that is an expectation by allies that we hear over and over again. So I think what needs to happen is a bit of a thinking about what military leadership means in the German context and I think what we're seeing sort of crystallized out of the last year is that it could mean taking more responsibility, offering European partners to align themselves with our armed forces, but not acting alone, right? Acting in alignment. Because, Germans, because of German history, but also because I think Germans believe that that's the right policy. But I think it's really important to say over and over again that acting in alignment with partners does not need to mean waiting until somebody else acts and then jumping on the train, right? It can mean proactively shaping coalitions, not just with DC, but also with, with other Europeans. And that's what I'm hoping that we'll see this idea of, of German military leadership in the future. And maybe just two more points, which is one, this idea that I also want to re-emphasize that um, polls fluctuate and they really depend on political messaging. One good example of that is the question of whether Germany should send tanks or not, which um, until very recently there wasn't a majority for that. Um, German citizens were against that. And then when the government started really making the case for why it was necessary, now we actually do see a majority in favor of sending tanks to Ukraine. So I do think it's important to think about the sort of priming impact of, of leadership on, on public opinion. Um, and yeah, I think maybe just a final point on the idea of the distinction between military leadership and diplomatic leadership, I think is something that we have to overcome <laughs> that distinction and that gap in the German conversation. That we see huge support for diplomatic engagement and very little support for military engagement. And I think actually they're often the same thing <laughs> and they often go hand in hand. And that's something Absolutely. that I would like to, to yeah. hear more. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a great point. And I think that the, um, 
The question that I had as I was looking at the, at the polling numbers um, was it's interesting to see a reluctance when it comes to military leadership, but at least a willingness to invest more in defense, right? So that's also a positive sign um, in terms of how the German mindset is, is changing. And you, know, you, you brought up the tank issue. Um, one of the things that I wanted to point out is that the, the data that we've seen is from August of last year, and a lot has changed since August of last year, and even more recently in January, we've seen a substantial change um, in opinion. Uh, Sophia alluded to it, but it, in early January, something like 42% of the German public was in favor of delivering tanks and 48% uh, against it. But by the end of the month, more than 50% of the, the German public was in favor. So there's been a shift, and it's important to put some of the data that we heard in the context of what's going on right now. What surprised me then also about this more recent poll was um, some of the splits within the German public and that um, over 60% of social Democrats were in favor. Over 60% of Christian Democrats were in favor. Not really surprising. But 75% of the Greens were in favor. That for me was a shocking, a shocking number to see. So this sort of leads to the, the second round of questions where I'd like to begin with you again, Ambassador Haber, um, and ask you, I mean, you talked a little bit about how some of the basic tenets of German foreign policy are changing rapidly and have changed with the Zeitenwende speech in theory and now also in practice. One question is, you know, can you talk a little bit more about some of those fundamental changes and, and help us really understand how difficult it's been to make those changes. But the corollary to that is one that's, that's sort of come up already in the conversation um, of how does one bring the public along? Um, is enough being done to educate and inform the public about the necessity of these changes? OK, so let me start with the first part of your question. Uh, and that is, what happened is, we threw overboard uh, um, a decade-long uh, conviction uh, that weapons shouldn't be sent uh, into um, uh, crisis and conflict areas, pulverized uh, by the Russian aggression uh, against, uh, um, uh, against Ukraine. Uh, and that came after a painful, really painful uh, debate, uh, including international debate, uh, where Germany was very much uh, uh, targeted. Uh, we uh, completely withdrew from our dependence uh, on uh, Russian fossil fuels. And mind you, for decades, uh, Germany had believed uh, or was convinced that interdependence was actually conducive to stability and predictability and uh, transparency. Um, but the Russian law, uh, uh, once and for all, uh, drove home the message that this is only true if both sides actually agree uh, on the objective of interdependence. If one side decides uh, that the a political agenda will trump uh, the economic benefits of interdependence, uh, and interdependence thus can be uh, weaponized uh, for political gains, uh, then this axiom is simply not true anymore, was just disowned uh, as well. Uh, uh, we are now, as I said, uh, one of the biggest military uh, supporters uh, of Ukraine, certainly in the EU. Uh, we are one of the overall uh, uh, biggest supporters uh, of Ukraine. Uh, um, we have completely upended our strategic thinking uh, on the 2% goal. Uh, the government has set up a 100 billion euro fund uh, that is designed to help us achieve that. Please do appreciate uh, the magnitude uh, of this uh, sea change uh, in, in German um, uh, strategic thinking. And I do share your frustration, Dan, uh, about the um, uh, large number of those, or at least the, the number of those who don't think Russia mm -hmm. is a threat as compared to the number of those uh, who think it's a major threat. Uh, but sometimes framing uh, attitudes have a long, longer life sp uh, span, especially uh, against the backdrop uh, of a re revolution uh, in security and strategic thinking. That's what's happening. I think the poll uh, really illustrates uh, to what extent uh, framing habits, framing patterns uh, um, persistently, uh, persistently uh, 
uh, survive even though the uh, um, uh, tectonic uh, environment uh, has fundamentally changed. That's what we're seeing. Also, um, I see in the poll, um, um, uh, to some extent, a survival of, um, um, what shall I call it, uh, um, assumptions or self-delusions uh, that were dear to the German heart because it assumed uh, uh, that all would be well <laughs> in the end. Uh, and this uh, fundamental uh, uh, Pollyanna-ish uh, um, uh, attitude uh, that um, we were surrounded by neighbors and we wouldn't have to take uh, military security issues as seriously uh, as we should have, uh, that's, also, uh, that's also history. Um, after all, a majority of Germans do say now uh, that military, uh, uh, that investment into the military is of overall uh, importance. So we've gone uh, uh, in the course of only uh, one year uh, through, a rev uh, through a revolution of political, economic uh, and, uh, uh, and strategic uh, uh, basic assumptions. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, the public uh, um, lags behind slightly. That's what usually happens in uh, uh, such revolutions. Uh, but it's distinctly moving, as, uh, uh, as Oksana and uh, Sofia have pointed out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Ambassador Marakova, you've been in Washington since April of 2021? That's correct. How have you seen relations between Kiev and Washington, between Ukraine and Washington, change over the last year? Well, we, to start with, we always had very close relations between our countries. And I think, you know, we have enjoyed good cooperation in the past, which started to increase in 2021, because I think, again, with the war, we always focus only on this phase of the war, what happened after February 24th. But the war started for us in 2014. And uh, in 2021, when President Zelensky came during his first meeting with President Biden, we actually achieved a lot of breakthrough agreements, which are the basis of this increased cooperation during the uh, past year after February 24th. So the Strategic Partnership Charter, which has been very profound on, on many fronts. The, a framework security cooperation agreement for five years, which is not public, but the short summary of it was public. Uh, so we started working on a number of uh, really deep areas of cooperation, including security, including investments, including anti-corruption work, including our European integration, including energy, well before Russia decided to reinvade us and start this full-fledged war. Now, of course, after February 24th, the U.S. has done for us what we will always remember. And it has been a decisive, very fast, not only bilateral help, but the leadership in rallying all other partners uh, and the swift provision of the security assistance and the budget assistance and uh, uniting uh, you know, forces with Germany, with other European countries, with other non-European countries in the Rammstein group, our contact security group. We now have more than 50 uh, countries that actually come together on, on, on a monthly basis discussing what and how we can do better. So um, it has been remarkable, not unexpected, but remarkable given the fact that before 1991, when Ukraine became independent, with a few exceptions of like a couple of years of independence in 1918 and other, we have been occupied by Russia for 400 years. So a number of countries, including the US, including our European brothers and sisters, saw us through the lenses of Russian propaganda, whether it was Russian Empire, Soviet Union, or uh, Russian Federation now. And um, it's very difficult. And I think some of the results we see in the polls are actually, you know, uh, is a reflection of that. So during this, 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 this uh, almost a year, since February 24th, what we knew about us all the time, what we told others that uh, you know, we will not give up, we will not surrender, that freedom, democracy, and independence are, you know, it's, it's like an air 
to Ukrainians, that we will rather fight and die than live under occupation. Mm -hmm. We said it, but I don't know whether a lot of people believed it when we said it before. Mm -hmm. And I think during this very difficult time for us, through all these losses and destruction and atrocities and war crimes and uh, you know, un uh, you know, something that you don't want your country to, to go through, never. But during this time, I think our relations are so much better and closer because many more Americans saw that, you know, we can walk the walk, that mm -hmm. everything that we have been saying is true. Thus, everything that Russians have been saying about us is a lie. And uh, because this fight is based on the truth and because it's you know, easy for us to inform the world about what are we fighting for, how we are fighting, uh, because we just have to get as many people on the ground, as many journalists, and just tell the truth. Now, it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. Still, a lot of people, as we saw, even in the United States, there is this small number of people who do not see Russia as a threat. So we still have to communicate, we still have to get the message uh, across, and we still have to rally everyone who believes in the same values that we have to win. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, I think our relationship have never been as close as they are today. And I think that's an you know, important statement given where we are. The decisive support from the United States is key. Um, but for me, that sort of raises a question around Jacob's last slide, which had more recent information and really sort of showed kind of a, a sense in the United States that, that America might be supplying too much support, too much aid um, to, to Ukraine right now. I think the number was going from, from, 70, from 7 percent to 26 percent in the space of about a year. And so I'd, I'd like to ask, ask you, Dan, um, you know, as, as somebody here in Washington, Given the results of the midterms, um, given this kind of a trend that we're seeing in, in polling, um, how concerned are you about Washington turning away from Ukraine at this decisive moment? I don't think that in the world the quality of American leadership that is most admired is our sustained attention. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say I'm, <coughs> I'm conscious of that and I'm concerned, but I'm not, I'm not inordinately concerned. Um, obviously, things are going to become uh, more difficult. There will be more distractions um, in Congress because of the divided Congress. Um, it's going to become more difficult for the administration um, to count on congressional support on anything. Um, but I think there are still sufficient a uh, number of people in Congress who understand the stakes of the moment. And, you know, I, I first traveled to Ukraine in 2010 as a diplomat with Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State and then went back, I don't know, a dozen times between 2013 and, and 2017 when I was U.S. Ambassador to the OSCE. And the progression of, I mean, I agree with you, the relationship grows ever stronger. And in the last year, I think there are tens of millions of Americans who have seen in the Ukrainians fight um, something that we recognize. Um, and whether you call that the human spirit or recognition of the stakes of freedom and recognition that it isn't just a localized conflict. And the same goes for Europeans. And, you know, Ambassador Haber, I should have said in the same way that the Americans should be concerned about the fact that Germans don't see us as a, a good partner on energy, Germany has been a stand-up partner on, on assistance. And if you look at the ranking, I mean, it's, it's a failure perhaps of, of the German uh, government to, con to, to convince others that, of how important Germany has been to supporting Ukraine. I mean, this is, a, this is a common project that we have now. It binds us together not only because we must be together in order to succeed, but because we are bound together on values on this project. And one of the things that I always talk about is the fact that, you know, uh, speaking about the Europeans, you know, the, the first place that anybody was ever shot and killed carrying an EU flag was on the Maidan in Kiev. Um, and when you have a project that is about universal values, whether that's the United States or the European Union, and you tell other people that those values are open to them, and they say, we want to be part of that project, we want to be part of those values, and you don't have an answer, that's on you, not on them. And, and so I, I really... I think we will be able to continue to make the case to the American people that the support of Ukraine and its, and its uh, resistance to Russian aggression is not only uh, is not some act of charity, 
but it is an act of our own identity and is an act that, it, that is in support of the security of the world and of the United States. And so I, I expect that um, we will continue to make that case. It is unfortunate that there is a part, that there appears to be a slight, it's not mm -hmm. huge, but a, that there is a partisan difference on this because I think it is something, even in a day where we see an immense polarization that Americans ought to be united. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think, I think um, you know, you've made some really important points about um, reliability in a sense, right? And we've, we haven't used that word yet, I think, in terms of our conversation today, but I'd like to bring Sophia back into the conversation because one of the overarching questions often is how reliable are the partners? How reliable is the partnership? Um, it's a question that, that seems to come up. I mean, today we're not talking about the Inflation Reduction Act, right? We're not talking about the economic side of things. We're, we're focusing more on foreign policy, national security issues. In my mind, we have a steadfast and reliable partnership, and I think that that's part of why the data is so positive about the relationship right now. But there are always these questions of how trustworthy is my partner across the Atlantic? How reliable is my partner across the Atlantic? What's, what's your take on that sort of reliability question? Huh. Um, so how reliable is Berlin to Washington? I think uh, in the sense of a shared commitment to the same values, a shared commitment to the transatlantic partnership, a shared commitment to the partnership with the US, um, and a shared commitment to continued support to Ukraine, absolutely, it's reliable. This government, I think, is a reliable partner to Washington. If we talk about, rely and I think this is, we have to talk about why these questions come up, right? If mm -hmm. we talk about reliability in the sense of predictability, um, I think it's important to keep in mind that the country is undergoing a sea change uh, on substance, but also on process, um, right? Institutionally, the Zeitenwende has implications for who is responsible, who needs to sign off on what. And I think this is what maybe Americans mean when they ask questions about reliability. I don't think it's a reliability to the shared commitment, but I think it's maybe a predictability that is sometimes uh, lacking. And in that sense, you know, maybe it is fair to ask for a little bit of patience as Germany is undergoing the sea change. Um, and then I guess we have to ask the question in the other direction as well, how reliable is Washington um, to, D to Berlin. Um, that's at least how I understand mm -hmm. uh, your question. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, this administration has really been, I mean, a dream partner <laughs> to Berlin in the sense of the continued engagement, um, the leadership in Europe, the patience, the really skillful alliance management, I think, that has happened. Um, so yes, absolutely, this administration is a reliable partner. But we have to add here, and this goes back to some of the points that you were making earlier, that you know, in Germany there is a relatively stable cross-party consensus on foreign policy and on our priorities when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, in the US, we don't have the same cross-party consensus. So when we talk about reliability, we always have to think about what comes next. And we can't necessarily rely on the next administration or the one after that to behave the way that this administration has behaved throughout this war, right? And to me, that is sort of the main problem, <laughs> if there mm -hmm. is a problem, um, in this really close US-Berlin alignment that we see currently, which is that I hope that the lesson that Germans are taking from this is not that we can rely on a sort of paternalistic US to take the lead in Europe always and to support to the extent that they're doing it right now always. Mm -hmm. And I hope that we're drawing the lesson that while we, it's amazing that this support exists right now, we also have to invest in a Europe that is able to act by itself and independently a bit more in the future. And I think that comes back to you know, one of the, the tenors of the conversation so far of not acting alone, acting together, but also showing leadership together. Um, as you've seen, we're, we're now moving into questions from the audience, and so if you have questions, um, please use the QR code to pose your question or use the chat if you're watching online. I've already started to get a few questions, which I, I will fold in, um, and one of our um, participants here is, is curious about uh, the refugee crisis uh, and is, would love to hear from, from both of you 
um, a sort of how Germany's response has been to the refugee crisis as a result of the, the war in Ukraine, and then sort of what your take is as, as a Ukrainian on that. Like yes, yeah, so, so <coughs> Germany's response. Um, we are hosting 1.2 million re Ukrainian refugees uh, in Germany today. Uh, they enjoy a green card-like uh, status. Uh, they can start to work right away, and if they are not employed, uh, uh, they have access, access to social security. Um, they can uh, attend their children, 200,000 about, uh, can attend tuition-free uh, German schools and German universities. Um, all of that um, happened in a very short time frame. I dealt with migration in the years of 2015, 2016 in Germany. These were two years when uh, we uh, hosted 1.3 million refugees coming from a vast area of origin, not only Syria. It was really a vast area of origin. But this was two years, whereas uh, um, Ukrainian refugees uh, in Germany, 1.2 million, came in less than a year, which meant uh, that it was a huge effort by German uh, cities, uh, by German uh, communities, uh, by German NGOs, by citizens, uh, by neighbors, by everyone, basically, to make sure uh, that this would happen without fits and starts. And I must say, uh, looking at it from the overall angle, uh, um, we did a very good job. There may be stories uh, um, uh, of deficits or, uh, um, uh, or underperformance, but overall, uh, I find that uh, we, uh, we made a huge effort uh, and we achieved what we wanted to achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, first of all, because of this aggression war, aggressive war and destruction and uh, everything else, 14 million of Ukrainians had to relocate, whether it was in Ukraine or outside. And out of this 14 million, eight actually are outside of Ukraine now, primarily women and children. So on the one hand, um, we do not call them refugees. We call them displaced people because mm -hmm. we want all of them back. And I know the majority of them want to go back. So it's like, uh, it's, it's a very important notion for us. Second, and we will also eternally be grateful to Germany, Poland, so many countries, pretty much every European country, and the US and Canada, uh, how quickly and how they have taken our people with open arms. So not only they did, you did a great job in welcoming them and providing for them, but um, we are also very proud that they also did an effort not to be a burden too much, try to get job as soon as possible. And again, we are dealing primarily with women and children. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's a very specific. There were some men who crossed the border to actually get them to safety and then returned. And during the first uh, months of war in March, we had more Ukrainians who came into the country than men. I, I, I should correct myself. More men that uh, returned to country than actually exited from the country. Uh, but um, so this is, this is something that uh, I'm positive Russia wanted to create as a crisis. Uh, mm -hmm. After the energy crisis, after the food crisis, or you know, after the war crisis, they wanted to create another migration crisis. And I think this is where they failed as badly as they failed with some others, because instead of crisis, it was a very difficult situation. It put a lot of strain on so many countries and so many budgets. But I think to get this is one of the uh, situations where we have shown remarkable unity, mm -hmm. help inside European Union, countries were helping each other, help from the United States to many countries. And we were able to, um, to go through it uh, very efficiently, efficiently and with a grace. Mm -hmm. And also during this uh, latest phase of attacks after uh, October, when Russia has been increasingly destroyed and destroyed more than 50% of our energy infrastructure, a lot of people expected that there will be another wave, and probably that was the, what Russia was counting on. But surprisingly, uh, you know, Ukrainians decided to stay and fight even without electricity, water, heat. So I think, you know, the focus now 
when I'm being asked what is the most needed humanitarian assistance and good, I always respond, weapons. Yeah. <laughs> the more weapons we will receive, the faster we will re liberate the territories, the less people actually will uh, move outside of Ukraine, and the more people will return back home. Thank you. That anticipates one of the viewer questions that we had of, of beyond tanks, what more can be done? It's um, my favorite question. Support, <laughs> yeah, support Ukraine. Um, and so is there anything else that you'd like to add to that? And then, Dan, if, there's, if you have any thoughts on that, I'd love to, to hear that. Well, it's very simple, actually. Um, it's clear that we need to win. To win means to return all of our territories within rec internationally recognized bodies, return all the people, and then work on accountability, rebuilding. There is a whole area of things to work on, according to President Zelensky's peace mm -hmm. formula, where all the steps are, uh, are described as our proposal. But in order to win, we need all the weapons. So in order to be effective, successful, and also to make the war shorter, we need all the capabilities. So from the artillery to firepower to longer distances to tanks, armored vehicles, you know, this is a very, uh, this war is a combination of the World War I and World War II war. Mm -hmm. The front line is very long. And in addition to that, Russia is continuously shooting at us everywhere in Ukraine with all kinds of missiles that they have. So the air defense and all range of weapons, and of course, also the uh, different air capabilities, whether it's aircrafts or UAVs uh, or helicopters, everything that our friends and partners are ready to share with us, everything that we can get in order to fast to get to peace, that's what we need. Okay, thank you. Dan, do you have anything to, to add to that? Yeah, I just, I mean, I want to underscore something that Sophia said earlier, which is that this false separation between diplomatic and military mm -hmm. is yeah. is something that comes clear also in this sense, in the, in the sense that those who want to see a diplomatic solution, which eventually there will be some court, sort of agreement, what, whatever, and we can predict that it will be unsatisfying now, mm -hmm. uh, but there will be something that comes out of, uh, out of this situation. Ukraine will be in a better position to negotiate, and, and it will make negotiation more likely if Ukraine is stronger on the battlefield today. Um, we can predict that. And those two things, the diplomacy and the military, go hand in hand in that, in that respect as well. And I agree with Sophia more broadly on that point. The other thing I wanted to point out is um, picking up on something that uh, Ambassador Haber said earlier. Like the, when, the, when the story of the Western or the, the, the friends of Ukraine, um, support for Ukraine is told, years from now, one of the most remarkable things will be the fact that uh, on February 23rd, 2022, there were three countries that were giving direct military assistance to Ukraine. And a month later, there were 30. Mm -hmm. It's really spectacular how quickly there was a group of friends that emerged that was making, that was making direct contributions and how sustained that has been. And that has taken a lot of hard work by all all parties concerned to, to sustain that, and that needs to continue. And the, the, inter, the interaction between that group and the Ukrainians is really important so that as the situation changes on the ground, the needs can be met uh, in that dynamic fashion. And then the last point I just want to make is that the U.S.-Ukraine cooperation in terms of, I mean, it, it is several times a day, back and forth, here's what's happening, here's what we're seeing, here's the kind of capabilities that we need, here's the kind of capabilities we might have, et cetera. And, you know, I mean, the, the kind of practical nature of this, this isn't just like you put things in a box and mail them over, the practical nature. One of the stories that will also be told is how all that's getting to where it needs to go, which is a really remarkable feat. And finishing on the cooperation between the U.S. and Germany on this front, I just want to make a point because there was a lot of press recently about a particularly... Um, loud volume phone call between our Secretary of Defense and, and a German counterpart. And I just want to make a point that that's actually a good thing to me, that when partners are working closely together, they're going to they're gonna be able to be honest with each other. And, and, you know, that kind of, like, frequent contact in order to kind of... There's, it's a high-stress situation, and I think the, the alliance between the partners and the ongoing communication with Ukraine on weapons in particular is essential, and, and I think it's been a great success so far, actually. It's a real success story. If I may add a little yes. bit on diplomatic versus military. Uh, first of all, we had experience in trying to, to use the diplomatic venue. Uh, in 2015, when not so uh, satisfactory uh, uh, <coughs> 
you know, 2014, September of 2014. 2014, 20, 2015, you know, depending on which part of that. But, but we were trying to use the Minsk Accords. And even though we, you know, it, it was not particularly fair to Ukraine, but we tried to implement it to the T in order to find a diplomatic solution and restore our territorial integrity through diplomatic solution. Uh, while Russia used all that time not to perform on those and prepare for the attack. Mm -hmm. And second, when we talk about the military solution versus uh, diplomatic, I think if we ask people differently, they would respond differently. So when you ask whether they want to be involved militarily, the majority of people do not want to see their sons and daughters on the ground there. And of course, the military solution is, is a very negative one from that standpoint. But if you would ask people, would they rather send weapons to us so we can defend ourselves? And we still have lines of people who want to defend the country. We are not asking for any military support in terms of troops. We are capable of defending ourselves. We just need the weapons. And if you ask that, and people would clearly understand that because of the Article 5, because of the Russian threats to so many other countries, that actually giving us more weapons is something that will prevent sending the people from different European and America and America and Canada to the, uh, to, to, to the wars if Russia decides to go further, then I'm positive that the majority of people would actually look very favorably on providing us with a little bit more weapons so that we can actually end this war while it's still in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Sophia wanted to weigh in on this as well, and then I have a question for Sophia and Ambassador Haber. Uh, sure. No, just briefly, I think on this question of weapons, uh, rather than discussing specific systems, I just want to make the point that I hope that this year we can move on from the sort of short-term thinking on weapons of the last year to more long-term planning, particularly when it comes to sort of defense industrial production capacity and the investments that are needed in and I'm speaking specifically about Europe, even though it's the, the same it's for the US, US yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the investments that are needed to expand production um, and also, I hope, to coordinate procurement. And that's important not just for the support of Ukraine and other front states, but also to make sure that you know, Western countries can continue to train and, and remain interoperable. And I hope that we see a speedier and larger investment in the ability to develop and produce and procure together uh, as Europe. And of course, that's also key for the, the modernization of the Bundeswehr, independent right. of the war in Ukraine. Um, there have been several questions about um, Germany's Ostpolitik. And so I'd like to maybe begin with Sophia and then bring Ambassador Haber back in. Um, one person is curious whether the, the sort of fundamental shift, the sea change in German policy toward Russia, um, marks a radical change in Germany's Ostpolitik, or whether things might sort of snap back to the way that they used to be. Someone else asks, is Ostpolitik dead? So, Sophia, do you want to take a first crack at that and then Ambassador Haber? Yeah. I can't predict the future, but I do think that what we're seeing right now is a sustainable change away from um, the, an idea that was prevalent about German-Russian relations for decades. And the main reason that I say that is our energy policy and the, you know, re ended the dependence on Russian fossil fuels. Not necessarily, I mean, Russia did its part in that, um, but right now the result is that we're no longer dependent. So that is one big reason why I think this romance <laughs> with Russia is, is over a little bit. Um, I also think that Ostpolitik is sometimes misunderstood. I mean, the idea of rapprochement, the idea of uh, an interdependence between economic relations and uh, diplomatic relations and I think a lot of that is sometimes short changed as you know Germany somehow being attached to to Russia in a sense that I think is is not necessarily longer the case and maybe was never the case. One thing that I hope is understood now is that Ostpolitik always relied on uh, actually a quite large defense budget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this idea of speaking softly while carrying a, a big stake, I think was. Uh, really important to why a lot of the German rapprochement and Ostpolitik worked really well. And if I look at, um, you know, some of the conversations in the Social Democratic Party, I think that is understood now. I, <clears throat> I agree uh, with Sophia. I would add uh, that Ostpolitik always had um, various layers. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, in the beginning uh, as a concept uh, of creating a new form of interdependence um, to enhance security. Um, it uh, uh, went on uh, to include the experience uh, of uh, Soviet uh, and then Russian acquiescence with German reunification, which played a role. Mm -hmm. um, it then went on uh, to really expand on the energy market. I know it started earlier in the 70s already, but the real development started in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. uh, when Russia really became strong because of the oil prices uh, and uh, um, uh, German companies to, um, recognized the business model. So it all added up. Um, and from as I'm saying that as someone who served in Russia a couple of times, uh, from the Russian angle, it meant uh, that Germany, in a way, was a partner of choice uh, with regard to Europe. You know, both is totally gone now, and it's irretrievable. <laughs> it's completely irretrievable. It's because of the war of aggression that Germany, uh, Germans were so, uh, so reticent uh, in recognizing as a as a real possibility before uh, February uh, 24th. It simply did not fit uh, into uh, um, uh, um, the landscape of what they uh, uh, thought was possible. So I am totally convinced uh, that there's no going back to a status quo ante uh, that had been, as we now see, after all, resting uh, on the number uh, uh, of um, uh, of assumptions and uh, desirabilities uh, uh, that uh, mm -hmm. Russia um, has destroyed. So I I'm totally certain of that. Mm -hmm. Can I just do things? Would you say that, I mean, in some ways it was always founded on uh, kind of an intersection of romance and money. And both yeah. both are gone. I think no. romance uh, is too uh, cute. But like, no, it's too cute. And actually, there were German interests involved uh, in, yeah. just in uh, the possibility of reunification and so forth, uh, and, uh, and more. Um, it, w it rested on an assumption uh, that was not totally wrong. After all, a reunification wouldn't have been was possible. Was a huge accomplishment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, so it, uh, this, um, uh, this assumption that interdependence uh, would be beneficial to both sides was right for a long time, until it wasn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's basically the experience uh, that uh, Russia had had uh, used uh, that um, axiom of interdependence uh, conducive to uh, um, uh, stability uh, in order to invest into a dependence uh, that could mm -hmm. be weaponized and exploited for political reasons. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. the truth as we see it now. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's a, a growing recognition that a policy that was correct at a certain time is no longer correct today. That's just and it. That's, I mean, that's what you just said, right? And that's, that's then the case that needs to be made more so in the public as well in Germany to bring people along that are skeptical about it um, and to, to continue sort of the, the education, if you will, that we've been talking about here today. Can so, I yes. just add one point? Because um, Ambassador Makarova really has made an important uh, point before, that generations... Uh, uh, of diplomats, not only in Germany, uh, also in other countries, uh, um, have been trained uh, in Russian policies using prisms uh, that were very much uh, framed yeah. by uh, Russian history. And that has to be, we have to reprogram that. I totally agree with you there. So as we, as we start to look to the future, right, and that's what we've started to do here, uh, Ambassador Ma Makarova, you started to do that, Sophia, you started to do that a little bit. Um, there are some, some questions from some of our viewers about the path forward. Um, I had a few, I don't know if we'll, we'll get to those, but, but one person um, writes, in the hope that the war ends sooner rather than later, and given the poll results that indicate a decreasing support for the U.S. and Germany's engagement in Ukraine, how are the governments in Germany, the United States, and Ukraine considering reconstruction, both in terms of bilaterally, but also in an EU framework? Um, you know, I don't know who wants to, to speak to that. First, there's an, another question um, for you, Ambassador Makarova, especially given your background in the finance ministry, um, of what the United States and the EU can do more to help support Ukraine now for that moment after the conflict is over. Maybe do you want to go first and then Ambassador Haber and then we'll, we'll come to Carnegie? Of course. 
Well, first of all, the priority now is to sustain the effort and win. So all the support that we can get, military assistance, military meaning security assistance, weapons, financial assistance, because again, we need to sustain the effort. And right now, the Ukrainian government is fully operational and in a situation of a full-scale war. But we need to be able to pay the salaries and pensions, even though we have put many austerity measures. And, you know, we have cut down everything we could have. But we need to, to continue the fighting. We need to continue the, the life in the country and, and defend. And, and we need our partners to continue to take very um, active actions to isolate Russia and to increase the sanctions on Russia. Mm -hmm. So altogether, all of that will help us to, to win fast, faster. And that's priority number one. Of course, after we win, that's when the whole big process of reconstruction will start. And um, we really dream about the time, to be honest, when we can not only inspire others how we can fight, but how we can build and how we can rebuild the country. And it's not only good for us, because after Ukraine wins, and after we start reviving the country and reconstruct everything, Ukraine will be, I'm positive, an answer to so many global challenges. Yeah. Food security. I mean, we can increase our productivity, even compared to what it was before the war, several folds. We can feed the planet globally. Energy. You know, with, of course, this unbelievable destruction, we now are working on a decentralized energy system in Ukraine. We actually deregulated pretty much everything, and we are looking at all type of new technologies, from SMRs to distributed uh, uh, energy production to everything super green. So we actually can leapfrog and, and create something really inspiring in that area. IT and innovation, not a lot of people are talking about how we are on the battlefield mm -hmm. using so many of the new technologies in a way it was never used before, and how in informational space and cyber war, which again, everyone was not only saw that Russia has the second largest army uh, on the planet, but they also are invincible in the cyberspace. And look where they are in the cyberspace right now. It's not because they didn't try. So um, I, I think, you know, we have to win because it's the right thing to do. It's a moral thing to do. We have to defeat Russia because the aggressive nuclear state should not be able to do that. But we also have to win because the whole planet will benefit from Ukraine being peaceful and prosperous and a, a, a member of the economic community where we can really become interdependable on each other, but only among the countries with the values that we share with the same values. So, Ambassador Haber, how is Berlin thinking about this future, this post-war post future? Reconstruction is not an issue for us uh, uh, of uh, let's cross that bridge when we come to it. We need to think about reconstruction now, yeah. and we do. There have been a number of conferences uh, where we try to identify uh, um, uh, where the focus should be, uh, what the roles of, res uh, of respective partners could be, uh, how to move forward. It's a bit like uh, the situation um, before the uh, 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 Russian aggression when we started to think about uh, potential sanctions against Russia. We did that as early as January uh, last year, which meant that uh, once Russia did what we hoped it would not do, uh, we are ready to act. Usually, sanctions procedures they take endless time, it's complicated, everyone fights, uh, etc. <laughs> Didn't happen that time because we were prepared. Mm -hmm. and that's exactly we fought before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, <laughs> in many ways. Um, but here, we were prepared. We had, uh, um, uh, we, it was all in the books. We just needed to uh, push the button, and that's exactly what we need to do with regard to uh, reconstruct and set up structures, set up mm -hmm. the procedures, uh, know where the focus is and what the sequences should be. Yeah, and be ready for it. Be when, ready for it. it that's always a good option. Sophia and or Dan, Go did ahead. you want to go first? Oh, no, I, I have very little to add to that, just that I find it heartening and important that especially European allies see that as their responsibility. And that I think the vision that you outlined, Ambassador, you know, maybe you shouldn't speak about reconstruction, maybe you should speak about modernization or a, a new rebuilding of Ukraine that uh, is a different country than it was before the war and in that way can, can play an important role globally. 
I want to answer the question of what the U.S. and Europe can do uh, additionally right now. One of the things we could do is work within the IMF to uh, yeah. remove some of the restrictions that, that the IMF has on investing in war-torn countries because Ukraine doesn't fit some of the categories that the IMF has, and Ukraine needs uh, fiscal support as well as uh, the military support right now. So that's one thing that we could do that I would flag. There's a commentary written by a former uh, finance uh, ministry colleague of yours, Alexandra Batili, uh, for Carnegie a few months ago that laid out a, an agenda for the IMF uh, to unleash some of that. She so was that, my chief economist uh, when I was the minister of finance. <laughs> <laughs> I met with her in June in, in, uh, in awesome. Kiev and, uh, and I said, wait, we should, you should work on that. Um, um, and she did a great, great piece. So, um, and then the other thing I wanted to flag is, I mean, um, two things. One, there's a lot of talk about how there will never be enough money to rebuild Ukraine. And I think the, the promise that you laid out is something that we have to stay focused on. Ukraine is a big country with enormous promise. If Ukraine had the GDP per capita of Romania, it would be three times the GDP that Ukraine had before the war. If Ukraine had the GDP per capita of one of the Baltics, it would be four times the GDP that Ukraine had before the war. If Ukraine had the GDP per capita of Poland, it would be five times the GDP that Ukraine had before the war. It is possible for Ukraine to be a big, prosperous country that is contributing to the European economy writ large, to the global economy writ large, in ways that will more than pay back whatever the costs of reconstruction are. So when people see these big numbers, they shouldn't be scared away. Of course, those big numbers aren't going to be entirely funded by public grants. There's going to have to be enormous private investment, and the, uh, the public side will have to work to de-risk and to, to help encourage that private investment. That's going to be really important. Um, but, it, but the promise is there. Uh, Ukraine has promise. And then the, the last point I would like to make is that we talk about reconstruction, and obviously there's a natural focus on, we've seen the images of physical um, destruction that have happened, and there will need to be physical reconstruction of enormous things and a chance to upgrade. There also has to be other layers of reconstruction. There has to be a reconstruction of Ukraine's democracy, which mm -hmm. is a real democracy, but it has been through a war. And any democracy that goes through a war has to go through a process of getting out of wartime footing and, and reestablishing processes that have been circumvented during a war. And that's going to take some kind of uh, focus on governance and reconstruction. And it's going to have to have human reconstruction, because people have been destroyed by this. Uh, mm -hmm. People who are still living have been destroyed by this. And the accountability processes will be part of the reconstruction effort and part of setting Ukraine up for success in the long run. And we all need to be ready to be partners on all the layers of reconstruction going forward. So Dan, when you opened um, this discussion today, obviously you talked about the fact that we're coming up on the one year anniversary of this phase of the conflict between uh, Russia and Ukraine. And um, I you know, knew going into this that there was some sense of optimism when it comes to the German-American relationship because of the polling numbers that we saw. But I really want to thank all four of you for giving me at least a sense of optimism of how things might continue, right? There's still a lot of work to do in each of our countries, um, both individually but also collectively. But that sense of promise that you spoke about and that you spoke about, I think, is, is something that I certainly take away from this conversation and hope that all of our attendees today uh, do as well. So on behalf of all of the organizers um, and hosts of this event today, I'd like to really thank particularly the two of you ambassadors yes. Yes. Uh, for thank being with so us much. today. And especially coming under the weather, although in the future I would like you to be always under the weather because I feel like it's an equalizing effect. <laughs> <laughs> no, very unfair. And thanks also to, to all of you and, and to those of you that have tuned in online for some great questions. Uh, I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of them, but there just wasn't enough time for that. But thank you. Thank thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 Ye